Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and we are at Cypress Lake, this right here. This is the only swamp on campus of a university in the United States here at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. I, I guess you gotta be number one for something. Today we're here for a bit of a history lesson. Today we're going to look at the history of the United States involvement with the Mississippi River in southern Louisiana, particularly at the confluence of the Atchafalaya, Mississippi, and Red Rivers, and how decisions almost 200 years ago have ramifications that we deal with today. The Mississippi River is at the center of the United States economy, allowing for goods from throughout the century U.S. to be easily transported to the rest of the world, mainly through the port of New Orleans at the mouth of the river. In fact, this potential was seen even from the beginning of the country with the Treaty of Paris after the Revolutionary War, ensuring that the United States border was on the Mississippi River, and the push by Thomas Jefferson to secure rights to use New Orleans as a port facility. This, of course, led the U.S. diplomats offering up to $10 million to purchase New Orleans from the French, who so they could have the entire territory for only $5 million more. As the U.S. expanded westward, the growth of river traffic led to two major navigational issues at the Lower Mississippi River that focus on the Old River area. The first was that the numerous meanders led to long travel times for boats, as well as hazards during low water because sandbars along the curves. Shipping companies pushed the U.S. government to do something about these navigation issues on the Mississippi River. The Rivers and Harbors Act in 1824 established the first legislation by the federal government to improve the navigation of rivers. It also placed the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in charge of these duties, a job that the Corps continued to this day. In addition, the government appointed the first superintendent of Western River Improvements to manage these operations. And enter Henry Miller Shreve. He was a homeschooled inventor and engineer. Shreve already had made a name for himself by breaking the monopoly of steamboat navigation along the Mississippi. And he was known as a talented naval architect and had a passion for changing the environment to improve river navigation. Shreve located a troublesome area for river bolts at the actual location of Old River Control Structure today. This area was called Turnbull Bend. This particular meander had extensive sandbar and added about 30 miles to travel down the Mississippi River. However, the neck was less than one mile wide. Shreve believed that if a channel was cut at the shortcut, the river would adjust its course down the channel and shipping could travel through it and by receiving a massive boost as a result of the decreased distance, as well as reduced shoaling, which is like the increase in sandbars. The additional economic benefit was obvious, but the geologic ramifications of this cut wouldn't be realized for over a century. In 1831, Shreve and his small fleet began digging the new channel, blasting the remaining distance with a flourish with black gunpowder explosives. The Mississippi River promptly complied and Turnbull Bend became Turnbull Cutoff. This artificial channel change upset the hydraulic balance or the river balance that had existed where the Red River dumped its contents into the Mississippi at Turnbull Bend, which then diverted part of its stream down the Atchafalaya River. At the time, the Atchafalaya River was nowhere near the size of the river it is now. Now, without the flow of the Mississippi to dilute its sediments, the Red River dumped its contents into the old Turnbull Bend, which not only caused problems for boats trying to sail from the Mississippi River to the Red River and vice versa, but also cut off the Atchafalaya from its main source of water, which greatly angered business interests along the Atchafalaya Basin. The second issue dealt with the Red River of the South. Now, the Red River flows from Oklahoma through northern Louisiana to the Old River area. This river could serve as a waterway for traffic between the Great Plains and the Mississippi Mississippi River, but for one small problem. Much of the Red River in Louisiana was unnavigable for steamboats because of several log jams throughout the river, most important which was a 260 kilometer, 150 mile long raft that had formed over thousands of years. In fact, the initial exploration of the river by the United States bypassed the raft completely because it was impassable even by canoe. Land speculators and shipping companies pushed the U.S. government to do something about the Great Raft. Initial estimates of the cost of removing the Great Raft were so high, Congress initially told the Corps of Engineers to abandon the concept altogether. Once Shreve was done with Turnbull Bin, he turned his eyes to the Great Raft. Shree had dug Turnbull Bend with a special riverboat design called a snag boat. Now, while a useful platform to dig a channel with his boat, he was called the Heliopolis. It was specifically designed to clear the rafts. Government officials were skeptical, but Shree would prove them wrong. A snag boat works by ramming the raft and breaking trees loose. The crane then lifts the tree into the boat where it's cut into small pieces. These pieces are used either as firewood or floated to the bank to be sold as lumber. The stumps that are left over either sunk in deep pools along the river or brought ashore. Once this is complete, the boat moves 
moves to the next tree for removal. It took nearly eight years for Shreve and his men to clear the raft, and in the process, Shreve and his men founded Louisiana's third largest city, Shreveport. When completed, there was an explosion of cotton and sugarcane plantations along the Red River, which could now freely ship their goods by water to the Mississippi River. While this was a wonderful benefit for the local economy, except for the influx of enslaved people to work on the plantations, that is, Shreve's work changed the dynamics of the Mississippi River in ways he could not imagine in any way, shape, or form. While Shreve was completing the clearing of the Great Raft, the state of Louisiana started clearing their own raft. It's a smaller one at the head of the Atchafalaya River. By the time they were done, the increased flow down the Red River's channel began to scour and grow the Atchafalaya River's own channel considerably. This threatened New Orleans' place as the port of choice for exports from northern Louisiana. A major flood in the 1840s brought a debate as to whether to open up Gold River to allow the Mississippi to divert more water during flooding. This plan, however, was rejected in favor of making a nutter cutoff just south of Old River and increase the height of the levees along the Mississippi River to decrease the chance of flooding. And one of the small ironies out of all this, the Atchafalaya, Mississippi, and Red Rivers achieved some sort of equilibrium during the Civil War and Reconstruction eras, as seen before Shreve's meddling in the 1830s. This equilibrium by the rivers allowed the focus of Louisiana to turn back to the Mississippi River itself and look to deal with the flooding of farmland that became a constant during this time period. The Mississippi River Commission believed that with levees high enough to contain floodwaters, there was no need for flood relief structures as the river would eventually flood less. Their reasoning was that because the river was confined to the channel by the levees, the river would deepen its channel naturally through scouring the bottom, lowering the surface of the river in the process. Now, while this is reasonable at first glance, this thinking is seriously misguided. The reason being the levee placements were too far from the banks of the Mississippi to encourage a scouring. As a result, the channel was too big to actually dig out the channel. During this time, Old River required constant dredging in order to stay navigable, even during high water. After many years of debates, it was decided that the Red River should not be allowed to lose its connection to the Mississippi River. An elaborate engineering system of dams and a two kilometer, a mile and a half long jetty would force most of the Red River into the Mississippi River and a small portion of the Mississippi being forced into the Atchafalaya. This ironically would create a situation similar to what existed before Shreve's cutoff. Only the dams were built due to economic constraints, and Old River continued to be dredged to allow for the river traffic to continue. The dam blocking the Red River was broken in 1901 after proving to be too hazardous for traffic. Though the two smaller dams at Simsport remained in place longer in an effort to keep the Atchafalaya at its current state. Despite all of this, the Mississippi River was beginning to be pulled away from its current channel and towards the Atchafalaya, as seen by measurements of the width and depth of the main channel. As I stated in my previous video on the Morganza Spillway, the flood of 1927 changed everyone's view of flood control on the Mississippi River. The Corps of Engineers and the Mississippi River Commission revisited the concept of floodways as a means of flood control, specifically as a means of protecting New Orleans from inundation, and the Atchafalaya Basin was seen as the cornerstone of these flood defenses. In order to prepare the basin for its job protecting New Orleans from river flooding, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began an extensive program of dredging the Atchafalaya River, as well as cutting a secondary outlet to the Gulf of Mexico, known as the Wax Lake Outlet. In addition, large levees nearly the same height as the Mississippi River levee sprung up, protecting the river areas along Bayou Teche that seen nearly four meters or 13 feet of water during the flood of 1927. Once again, while all eyes were away from Old River, subtle changes were taking place in response to the meddling, both from Shreve in the 1800s and from the floodway improvement efforts. For one, the Mississippi's entrance to lower Old River was altered to allow a more direct path to the channel, which sent more of the Mississippi down the Atchafalaya, causing scouring and increasing its capacity further. This consequence was a second change. After a major flood of the Red River in 1945, the status of Old River changed as the former pattern of current swapping from the Mississippi and Red River back ceased. With the Red River losing its connection to the Mississippi River and the Mississippi itself began sending water exclusively down Old River to the Atchafalaya River and out to the Gulf. The percentage of the Mississippi River's flow to the Atchafalaya increased steadily Steadily, threatening a channel switch. In 1945, geologist Harold Fisk released a monumental report about the dynamics of the lower river. I'll include it in the show notes below, highlighting the inevitability of a channel switch. Six years later, in 1951, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers released the Atchafalaya River Study, which predicted an irreversible slide to a channel switch within a decade. The need to halt this channel switch depended on not just controlling the flow of water to the Atchafalaya, but also the flow of the sediment. While the water was traveling down the Atchafalaya, 
at an increasing rate, the amount of sediment following the water wasn't the same. The result was that the Mississippi River was losing its flow and slowly becoming more shallow due to increased sedimentation. Any solution had to keep the ratio of water and sediment the same in order to bring the entire system into equilibrium. The Corps decided to call on an Einstein, literally. Hans Albert Einstein was the son of the famous physicist and considered to be one of the world's foremost experts on understanding river sediments. To help solve the problem, Einstein and other scientists used a 200-acre model of the lower Mississippi River to see whether their calculations were correct. A version of this model is actually still in Vicksburg and can be visited at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Museum. It's a really cool place. I'll have a future video on that. Using these calculations, the Corps of Engineers developed the worst-case scenario for river flooding and looked to develop a control structure that could keep the Mississippi River on its current channel, even if the doomsday scenario happened. The present location of old river control structures was found to be the best location to control the flow of water and sediment, and construction began soon afterward. And if you want to learn more about the structures, check out my video on Old River. It was the first video in Phenomena Explained, and actually the first on the Mississippi River playlist I have. So there you go, a detailed history of mankind's interface at Old River. It truly is a textbook study of the law of unintended consequences, as every attempt to make river navigation and flood control easier for shipping or to protect lives or property made navigation and flood control more difficult. Eventually put the Army Corps of Engineers into a corner where the old river control structures had to be built as a last-ditch effort to at least put a permanent channel switch on hold. Some days it may have been just better for Shreve to leave his cutoff alone in 1831. And in our next episode, we'll take a trip into the an unknown date in the future and look at the consequences of a channel switch of the Mississippi River to follow the Chafalaya River channel and the economic and structural impacts it would have not just for Louisiana, but across the United States. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button. And also, if you're interested in watching more content like this, make sure you click on not only the subscribe icon, but also the notifications. That's the bell to be informed of when new content comes out. So in addition to these videos on science and history and how they impact the state of Louisiana, I also have a series of videos made specifically for middle school science that's based on not just the Louisiana student standards for science, but also the next generation science standards. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please post them below, and thanks for watching.